Cari amici sportivi, Stevie P is back on the local soccer show, guys. Nice to be back. Thank you to our friends uh, from the Ball is Round for filling in for me as I had a work Halloween party uh, for the last local soccer show. I'm not going to tell you my, uh, my costume. That's uh, private information. But uh, let's get down to it, guys. Uh, we have a great guest tonight who's going to share some knowledge and wisdom on a topic that we, I think we don't touch on enough. Uh, something that I for sure have taken for granted along uh, uh, along with many others. Uh, but before that, guys, a uh, special thank you again to Evangelista Sport for being the sponsor of the local soccer show. Greatly appreciate it. It's World Cup time, guys. So evangelistasport.com. If you're not in the Montreal region, check out their website. They have everything ready for you. Team Canada, look at this beautiful shirt. You can see my pectorals. Uh, we're all ready. They dressed me up nice for tonight. Thank you to uh, Carmelo, Nico, and Mr. Sanzaloni and the team at Evangelista Sport. If you're in beautiful Montreal in La Belle Province, check them out. 6821 Boulevard saint Laurent. Have a, have a good day there. Spend some time there. Spend some money there, guys. That's what they're going to want you to do. Uh, there's uh, tons of soccer apparel. There's great stuff for your club in terms of training uh, material, uh, Guys, goaler equipment, uh, cleats, indoor, outdoor shoes, uh, you name it, they have it. Evangelista Sport, check them out. They do ship pretty much everywhere and uh, we'll get you your soccer apparel. So on tonight's show, uh, Presidente got us a fantastic guest, Richard Bucarelli. Uh, he is the president of Speed Training and Soccer Fitness. So Presidente, let's roll the intro and let's get Richard in here. Richard, welcome and thank you for coming on the local soccer show. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, bonjour, bon, bonsoir. I, I, I'm trying my best. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't pay enough attention in, in, in French class in high school. But, uh, That's but no I, I love worries, them, uh, no worries, yeah. Richard. It's nice to have you on. Guys, what are the chances that we're talking to Richard, who is a fitness specialist? He will tell you about his story. He has many, many other titles when he introduces himself. But he's, it sounds like he's actually in a gym, guys. So, uh, I, I Believe it or not, I am. So I'm, I'm here inside a, 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 my, my business, uh, the Speed Training Lab and High Performance Center. And we have a physiotherapy uh, uh, clinic. And these two facilities are inside a sports facility where we have, you know, basketball, volleyball, soccer. So you'll hear some of the noise. Maybe if it gets bad, I'll mute. But, you know. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful background music to everybody's right. ears uh, to yeah. have you on. Again, Richard, I really want to thank you for taking the time to be on the local soccer show. You're if welcome. you know you've watched it before, uh, you, you did your checks, you know what me and Presidente try to do with the local soccer show. Bring out some information to, you know, uh, new topics of conversation. But before we start, you know, all the guests who are going to watch it tonight live, or watch it while they're doing their treadmill or, or, or their training, because they, once they hear you, they're going to go back to training. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into soccer and your journey from a kid to where you are now? Right. So, I mean, I, I was a player. Uh, I'm from Toronto. So I played uh, in, in a, few, a couple of different clubs in Toronto. And, and eventually um, I played uh, in university at York University. Um, you know, and, and, and for a few years in, in a league called the CPSL, the Canadian Professional Soccer League, maybe, maybe you guys remember that league. Uh, so, you know, I, I was a decent player, but you know, not, not, not great, not, not good enough to make any money. Uh, at the time that I was playing, uh, again, in university and in the CPSL, I was also um, I was, uh, uh, coaching youth soccer with a local club. And I was also studying sports science in university. I was studying kinesiology. And um, so some of the uh, parents of the kids I was coaching, you know, at the time uh, they, they knew that I was into fitness and, you know, I was doing some personal training on the side. And so they knew that. So they said, hey, you know, my son, you know, he's a little slow, whatever. Can you train him and, you know, stay after practice? And they offered to give me 30 bucks. And I was like, great. Yeah, I'll do that. You know, I didn't even know that was something I could do. So I did it. And then, you know, eventually some coaches from – 
the, the same club, but like, you know, they were training beside us on the field and they saw what I was doing and they said, well, you know, maybe can you train my team and, you know, you can stay after practice for another hour and we'll give you 50 bucks. And I was, I was blown away, honestly. I mean, this is like 25 years ago. So uh, basically by the time I graduated, uh, you know, I had this like little part-time business going, you know, training soccer players. And at the time, you know, there was no such thing as an actual business doing that. There were some that were training hockey players. So maybe you guys have heard this term dry land, you know, like that was, I was aware. And some of us that were studying kinesiology and whatever, we were aware of these companies that did dry land training for hockey. And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, there's, there's thousands of soccer players around here, you know, and, and there's no, you know, they need fitness and nobody's training them. So maybe instead of, like when you graduate with a kinesiology degree, you can go to, you know, if you have the grades, you can go to medical school, you can become a physiotherapist, you can, you know, there's many directions you can go. And I said, well, you know, maybe I'll, I'll use my knowledge and my, you know, kind of, you know, my experience here and, and I'll do this full time. So that's what I did. Amazing. And, uh, yeah, I, I had this little business called Soccer Fitness and, you know, it was definitely a long journey to get where I am now. Um, I guess if I'm making a long story short, once I decided to do that for my career, which is to train soccer players, <clears throat> I kind of had, you know, in my head this idea that I said, well, I, I want to try to be the best, you know, that I can be in this career. And so I, I came up with these different categories of, you know, ex expertise. And in each one of them, I wanted to try to excel. So I said, well, I'm going to have to become an expert coach and I'm yeah. going to have to do my licenses and all that. So I did. I got all the way to my A license. And, you know, I said, well, you know, I'm probably going to have to have a facility because it's not enough just to go running around from field to field. And, you know, so eventually I had saved money and opened a facility. And um, in the facility, I, I kind of figured as well that, you know, I had my degree, but that doesn't, you know, that's a bachelor's degree. It doesn't really make you an expert. So I'm going to have to, you know, continue my education, eventually get a master's and, and a PhD. And I'm very close to finishing that PhD. Now should have been already because of COVID. I didn't, but I wanted to conduct research on soccer and specifically to conduct research using the, you know, the, the training that I'm doing to try to help, you know, validate it and, and examine it and all that. And so that's what I did with my research, with my graduate work. And we can talk later, but I've got some really unique equipment in my facility. I have the fastest treadmills in the world. Amazing. Treadmills that, that, um, that go at very high in like we have, we have some really unique stuff that, so my, 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 my graduate work, my PhD is in, biomechanics and physiology and so you know i've been able to test out and, and and modify the training that we do and try to perfect it through the research and the other thing that i figured i was going to need and again i came up with this all when i was about 23 years years old right 23 24 i figured i i needed to work at the high level in my sport because that's the way you get credibility and 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 so i started just volunteering with york university because that's the school i had played at and you know, they, they'd, we'd already become a little successful while I was there, but afterwards became very successful. Yes. Maybe, you know, right. And, and so I was part of some of those teams as a coach and eventually, uh, you know, I, again, I opened my facility. I got hooked up with the national team, uh, women's team. Um, you know, I worked with Toronto FC. I, I spent some time working with professional clubs overseas. I mean, you know, I can get into it, but I was always very driven to, 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 to get, to the highest level in soccer, to the pro or the national level as a coach and as a fitness coach, because I, you know, I, I knew that that was going to kind of elevate me in, in, in my career. And, and, and anyway, so that's the, the short version of a, of a long story. Amazing. That, that's a great story, Richard. <laughs> uh, amazing stuff and good for you. And uh, uh, that PhD and, uh, and whatever HDs you need after that, yeah. I'm pretty sure you'll be more than, uh, more than qualified to get it. You know, Richard, one of the questions that I you know probably uh, some people might ask themselves too, like uh, kinesiology, what is it exactly? You know, can you explain a, a short description of exactly what that is? Is it a word that I, before meeting you, I had no idea what it meant. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, it's literally, literally the study of movement. So kinos is, you know, the Greek movement and you know, ology is, is, is the study. So, so it, it's, it's exercise science with a focus on, on movement. So you study um, uh, uh, biology, you study uh, physics, but it's biomechanics. So kind of the, the physics of movement, you study exercise physiology. And so that's where biology kind of leads into the, the physiology of exercise. So we learn about, about the heart, about the muscles, about how we generate energy, um, you know, all those kind of things. And then again, because it's exercise science, there's a lot of a focus on, on um, things like, periodization of training which i know we'll talk about later and how to plan training 
uh, fitness assessment, you know, how to test uh, athletes, but also how to test, you know, people from the general population. Um, there's health, there's nutrition, uh, disease prevention. Uh, there's kind of a, it's a broad category, but really it's like, like physical education, uh, but, but with a focus a lot on, on, on the science. So. Amazing. Yeah, super interesting. Mm. You know, we touched on it, and one of the big hot topic items that we always talk about on the show is Canada's club licensing program and what they've done there. I would love to, you know, someone like yourself who I'm not saying is not directly involved, but like you said, you took all your licenses, you understand what it is to become a coach in, the, in this program here. What are your thoughts on Canada's club licensing program? I should mention I, I was involved. Um, so I, uh, for many, many years, uh, I, I taught uh, the fitness component of the Canadian national uh, licenses. I also have a course that I teach called the Soccer Fitness Trainers Course. It used to be, was picked up for many years. I, I taught it through Ontario Soccer, you know, not anymore. Uh, but but um, the, the coaches from Ontario and Canada Soccer that developed the club licensing uh, system um, you know, basically, I was the one that helped them to develop the standards for the physical part. So I, 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 I know very well. So I think it's great uh, that that the the uh, uh, you know Canada Soccer and the provincial associations have been working for many years to try to set standards. And of course, the standards go way beyond just the physical, you know, training and testing and all that. Like they, you know, they have standards for licensing and. Uh, you know, um, uh, safe sport and, and all of it, right? Like the administration, it's good. Um, the one thing I would say, <clears throat> and you know, I, um, not to be too controversial about it, but setting standards. Oh no, be controversial. Yeah. We all like, right, okay. Well, yeah, we like that. <laughs> yeah. So what I'll say is, setting standards is one thing, but making sure that those standards are actually being met is another. And so. Again, I can give lots of examples of, you know, things that I had recommended. For example, I recommended that fitness assessments should be mandatory for all high performance leagues, but that those assessments should be, and this is, this is standard practice for sports science, the tests need to be reliable and valid. And for the tests to be reliable and valid, they have to be conducted in a standardized location, preferably in the same location, but if not, at least it has to be, for example, indoor. It has to be on turf and it always on turf. You have to use the same equipment, right? You have to, you have to ideally, again, maybe even the same people doing the test. And that that data, when we're collecting test data on players, then we need professionals, can be me, can be other people, but people that know what they're doing to, to look at the data, to track the players, to monitor progress, to, to identify players that are showing very well, that, you know, maybe, you know, can be uh, candidates to go, you know, to the next level. And, Honestly, uh, Stevie, none of that was done. That's Literally the none. So, so the tests were not uh, 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 consistent at all. Some were outside, some were inside. Some used uh, electronic systems to measure speed and power. Others used, you know, stopwatches. I mean, it was, it's a, it's just not been implemented at all. And not, and on top was, of it, it was not standardized. And not at all. Even, even playing field. And there's never, never been anyone at Canada soccer or Ontario soccer that has ever been put in charge of actually looking at the data. I'm not so sure in 10 years in these high performance leagues that we've had anyone looking at youth players test data. And remember that the high performance leagues are the leagues that feed the provincial teams, which feed the national teams. So these are all the best young players. Nobody's looking at their fitness test data. So that's a huge, huge problem, which needs to be addressed. You know what, and, you, and, and I agree, uh, you know, I've always said it here, you know, it, it, we, have to, we have to look at it objectively, like it, it's very good that, you know, the, we're getting, you know, some information about licensing and, you know, a standardization top down, but we need to look bottom up as well. Like the, 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 the programs at the national level or the provincial level need to know that if you do it at let's say a, a grassroots level it's you, you've already have something to compare it to once they once they reach to that next level and like you said it's disappointing to hear that you know uh, it's not part of it but I, I don't know why you know and again i'll say it for you yeah uh, you know uh, i'm always around local soccer and they always use the excuse of budget but uh, yeah. that can't be all the excuse all the time right uh, 
uh, again, I don't want to put you in a bad spot, but it, it really bothers me when you know we tend as humans to use money as a way to to discourage people from doing something when that's not true, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, what what I would say is is um, you know obviously uh, you know whether it's a club, academy, or provincial association, whatever you know, if they want to bring in fitness professionals, you know, people want to be paid, and you know, of course we do, you know. But the truth is, you know, you're right. It's not prohibitive the, the cost that would be involved I, I did it for many many years with many clubs here in ontario so I, you know again i won't name names of course but like you know we had programs in place where where the fee per player like per, per player per year was about between 200 to 300 dollars, and that program with that fee provided three fitness tests standardized one day a week of dedicated fitness training and coach education and that's you know kind of the next thing piece that i really would like to talk about because that's another thing you know that that if we're talking about how to deliver better fitness to players they need to be tested standardized ideally it's good to get you know professional fitness people involved but there's always constraints there's yeah. no club or academy even toronto fc i mean i i I don't know a lot about what's happening in the Montreal Impact Academy. I, I know before. I don't know now. But, you know, even in, even in those professional academies, when I worked at TFC, I was one fitness coach with the whole academy, and I was part-time. So even in those levels, they don't have one fitness coach with every team every day. So it's never going to happen at the amateur level. Yeah. So what does that mean? Well, that means the clubs have players. They need physical training. They cannot logistically, never mind even money-wise, but they cannot logistically bring in a fitness professional for every practice every day. No. The coaches have to know about fitness training. They have to be educated. And in Canada, we have done, I mean, I don't even want to say a poor job. We haven't educated coaches at all yeah. about physical fitness. So the coaches in Canada can get all the way to their A license. I know because I've done it, Okay. And they tell you absolutely nothing. They tell you nothing about fitness testing. They tell you nothing about periodization. They tell you nothing about injury prevention. They tell you nothing about how to plan training. So they're left on their own with no knowledge. And, you know, the results are that, that we are not training our athletes properly at all. So. Yeah. No, uh, again, very, very, uh, very eye-opening to, to see that. Uh, you know, I, I, I follow a lot of, uh, obviously, you see in the back of Milan. And, you know, uh, <laughs> Me too, by the our... way. I, I didn't tell you that, but yeah, I've been a Milan fan. Richard, we knew. That's kid. why you're on the show, and that's why all the easy questions are coming your <laughs> that's way. That's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, Milan has always had a, a terrible, you know, not, not always, we've had, once the, the the mythical Milan lab was there, and yeah. you know, we seemed like we were impenetrable. We were we were creating players that never got injured. Right. Now at Milan, you know, we always see the constant muscle fatigue, injuries, uh, pulls, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, not not uh, not breaks, but it's a lot of soft tissue injuries, muscle pulls. Uh, you know, we always hear the famous polpacho, which I'll uh, <laughs> translate to calf for everybody. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? You know, at those clubs, they have a fitness coach. They they, they talk about it all the time. Why, you know, especially in a, in a continent like North America, U.S. and Canada, yeah. where you know we kind of took the avenue of creating an athlete in first and a soccer player second. Yes. Why would we not focus on that at the grassroots level or in these training <clears throat> sessions? So uh, I, I, I want to be uh, clear that we can just differentiate that. Like, so the, the Canada, and I know this because I work, I mean, I worked for a year in Uruguay and, I, and through my, through my uh, academic work I've, and, and my work with the national team, I've traveled all over the world. So I know that Canada in, in soccer has a reputation of having all oh, these great athletes, right? And we do, we have good athletes. But the reason we have such good athletes is because we have a very diverse population and, you know, we have lots of... Uh, 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 you know, uh, people coming from all over the world, including a lot who are who are genetically really great athletes. Like, yes. like that's an advantage we have. Look at our national team now. I mean, we've got lots of players that are fast and 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 have excellent endurance, and 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 that's great. But the truth is that that you know we've got good athletes. The fact that we have good athletes does not mean that we are the ones that are training and making those athletes. We have to be clear about that. Yeah, yeah. 
And, 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 you know, so, so, so when I go back to, you know, what I'm talking about here with, with, let's say with regards to uh, the training that the athletes receive, and maybe I know you're asking about injuries and, you know, how do we connect the two? Okay. So, so the, uh, um, and, and this is something I've, I've written about. I, I've had, you know, articles, both an academic paper, as well as articles on blogs and things, which I call the overtraining myth. Yeah. So I'll explain what I mean by this. So the message that we're getting from Canada soccer, Ontario soccer, and from, you know, more or less the, the, the long-term athlete development model is that the reason that young athletes, soccer and other athletes, right? The reason they're getting hurt is because they're doing too much. They're overtraining. That's what we're being told. Okay. So I can speak for soccer because I've tested thousands of soccer players and the bulk of that has been at the youth amateur level. So I know very well, right? The fitness level of youth amateur soccer players in Canada is very, very low. Nobody is in shape. And part of that, as I said, is because I think we don't educate coaches. Coaches are, don't have the knowledge to do physical training. And most of the time, the practices are not intense enough and the players are not fit, right? So since we know that they're not in shape, it cannot be that the players are getting hurt because they are overtraining. Because overtraining only occurs when you're actually training a lot we're talking four, five, six hours a day, and your fitness level would be very high if you were overtraining. Yeah. So the, the athletes, the message we're getting is wrong. That's why I call it a myth. It's a myth that they're getting hurt because of overtraining. In fact, what's happening is they're undertraining. They're not training hard enough. And because of that, then they go into games unprepared. And that lack of preparedness, that's what causes them to get hurt. So it's not too much. It's too much too soon. And that's because coaches don't understand periodization of training. And if they did, then we'd be able to, you know, we'd be able to, 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 to build up the athlete's fitness a lot more and the number of injuries would go down. So that's the point that I've made. So does that make sense? Or Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's crazy. It's just uh, I, I keep on thinking of all the injuries that I see, you know, across the board. Right. You know, and uh, I was one. And again, maybe I'm completely wrong. I thought they just were playing too much soccer. Like yeah, so I, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. It, it's possible that there's, you know, maybe, you know, too many games. Not, but, but really, if we look at the volume of exercise, right? Like, like so, you know, we can see in many other sports. I mean, kids uh, at, at 10, 11, 12 years old, specifically before puberty, right? There's lots of other sports where, where kids at that age can train a lot more. I see the question here about, you know, U9, U10. I mean, the reality is that children at that age can handle a lot of exercise, but it, they have to, it has to be periodized. Maybe, I don't know if, if Marcello can put yeah. the, the graphic up and I'll just explain, you know, what I mean, because I say periodization. And so what we're looking at here, okay, this might look complicated, but I'm going to make it really, really simple. It's the acute to chronic workload ratio. This is the ratio between the acute load, which means whatever you do today. Okay. And you can calculate it And by the way, in my courses, which I pushed for 10 years to make mandatory for the coach licensing here in Canada, and nobody ever wanted to work with me on that. So nobody gets this information unless they come and find me. Okay. But we teach this and we teach a way to measure it where you don't even need technology. You can measure the training load. You can measure how hard the players are working today. Okay. What this ratio is, is the ratio between what they do today and the average of what they've done over the last three weeks. So if you can imagine, imagine for three weeks, you did no exercise at all, right? You just went for a walk, nothing. And then today, after three weeks of that, you know, you have to go and run for two hours on a soccer field. The ratio between what you did today and what you've been doing for the last three weeks is way too much. It's too high. Okay. Okay. So where do we get into the injury risk or the danger zone with athletes? That's when the ratio is 1.5 or more. What does that mean? That means that today you would have done something which was 50% greater than what you're capable of. That's the problem. If kids are getting hurt more, it's because of this. That's not what overtraining is. If you keep the ratio, you see the green, and I, I'm, mo I'm moving my mouse. Maybe you can't see my mouse on the screen, but no, no, no. He's yeah. sharing. He's sharing. He's sharing the picture. He's sharing it, right? <laughs> but, but you, but you can see the ratio, the green, the sweet spot where the injury yeah. risk is low. If you, if what you do today is 
as low as 20% less than what you're capable of, you know, or up to 30% more, kind of within the range of 10 to 30% more, then you're making small increases in load without going into the danger zone. Now, this is only possible in soccer if you measure it. So you need coaches that understand it, that know how to measure it, that take the time to measure it. It doesn't take long. And as I said, we have a way that we can do it almost free. We, yeah. may, we actually built an app in my business that lets coaches do this. Okay. Wow. But if you do this, then you can plan week by week and, or, or in a cycle. Let's say a cycle yeah. is 10 days or two weeks at a time. You can plan to make these small incremental increases in training load. And then nobody gets hurt. Before puberty, children actually can exercise a lot more than they can after puberty because they're lighter. Their bones and joints are much more, you know, uh, pliable and resilient. So what we do, like, you know what we do in soccer here is we, you know, and again, this is all Ontario soccer just because there's, there's nobody that's competent that knows what they're doing. They tell coaches at U10, U11 or whatever at those younger ages, no more than two practices a week, no more than three practices a week, no more. And as the kids get older, they say that's when you can add more training. Stevie, that's backwards. Yeah. Before puberty, kids should be exercising two, three, four hours a day. They should have, they should be on the cross country team. They should be exercising at recess with their friends. They should be exercising with their brothers and sisters and their friends in the neighborhood after school. And they should be playing soccer almost every day. And when they get older, that's actually when they're bigger, stronger. That's when the risk of injury is higher. So as a matter of fact, we should turn that whole model upside down. And we should say from the age of you know six or seven up until puberty, for boys, that's about 13. For girls, that's about 11. Okay, 11 and a half. Until puberty, let them exercise a lot, but periodize it. Yeah. So don't throw them into games when they're not prepared. Periodize it. And they can get to the point within six months to a year where they can handle three hours a day of exercise. Mm -hmm. We know that kids can do this because they do it in other sports. If you yeah. have a kid that does gymnastics, and by the way, most of the elite female gymnasts are, you know, pre-puberty or right around that age, they train five hours a day yeah. and they don't get hurt. So yeah, it's, it's different yeah. for, for a lot of sports. Uh, I have my daughter in gymnastics and there you go. And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's shown like they, they encourage you to come a lot of times. Uh, for me, one question that, that I would have, uh, you know, I'm looking at, at the soccer at, at the U9 level. Let's take U9, right? Uh, again, by age group, how would you break it up? Like, let's say micro level, four to eight, kids nine to 12, and then teens 13 to 17. How would you, how many trainings are appropriate? Okay, so um, I'll, 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 there's one caveat, which is just that um, age is one thing, that's chronological age, but there is a way to determine the developmental age of the athletes. And by the way, it's not expensive. All it requires is you have to measure the, their standing height They're sitting height, so they're uh, on, on the height uh, where, where you know the height of the chair. So they sit down and you measure sitting height, body weight, and you need to know uh, their birthday and you know how old they okay. are, right? So, so if you take those measurements, there's, an, there's a formula, there's an algorithm that you can use to calculate developmental age wow. because not all nine-year-olds are developmentally nine. Not all 12-year-olds are developmentally 12. Typically, and again, I did this in the provincial program before, and I did this in the TFC Academy because I had studied this stuff and I knew how yes. important it was. Most teams, there's a range of developmental age of about three years. Meaning, if your kid is under 12, in that team, there are some kids that are developmentally ahead by a year or so. They might be 13 or 14 even. And some are developmentally behind by a year or so. They may be only 11. And they're all together. So yeah. the first are, thing is, you need to know developmental age. Are you going to charge me? Because I'm going to use that. Take it, man. I, and if you email me, I'll send you all the stuff. I, I, like I, said, I, I teach this stuff, but this is like, it's not, you know, it's not expensive and it's not, and it shouldn't be, there should be no barriers to this. But again, yeah. I can tell you, nobody at Canada soccer, nobody at Ontario soccer, not even in the national youth license. Okay. I was brought in for the pilot project for the youth license and they told me they didn't have time in the course to teach this. So it's not, so it's not, it's not taught. 
Nobody really knows shocked. it. I'm really it's, shocked. Actually. Yeah, trust me, man. It, it's it's if you want to know why things are the way they are, you have to start from the top and and look down because yeah. that, that that's where the problem is. So so in any case, you need to know the developmental age of your athletes. That's first, okay? From there, basically, the basic idea, you know, you don't necessarily need to say that there's a, a minimum or a maximum number of training sessions. You need to look at load because load, and you know, again, that, that graphic that we had, that talks about load. Load is not number of training. Number of training tells you only the time. Yeah. The formula to calculate load is time multiplied by intensity. I'll give yes. you an example, okay? You could exercise every day for three hours, but you could just walk at three miles an hour, let's say, okay? And you know what? Your volume of training is three hours a day. It's whatever. It's 20 hours a week, 21 hours yeah. a week, right? Okay. But your intensity is very low. And since we multiply volume by intensity to calculate training load, your training load is also going to be very low. Yeah. You, could, you have no problem with it. How but did you I, know I walk <laughs> and I don't run? <laughs> no, no comment. No, just, just an example, right? So now contrast that to running at, I don't know, 10 miles an hour on a treadmill for 10 minutes a day, okay? The volume is way lower, but the intensity is way higher. Your heart rate's gonna be maximum, right? Like, so, so it's, the com it's the product, not the combination, but the product of volume and intensity. That's how you calculate training load. And what we should be doing is we should be giving standards to coaches and this should be in coach licensing. There's no reason why it isn't there other than that the people at the top don't know and don't care. Okay. Yeah. But we should be telling coaches, okay, if your developmental age of your players is between 11 and 12, then the weekly training load should not exceed 3,000 units or whatever. And by the way, I'll just tell you because I saw someone ask a question about the name of the app. Okay. And I'll tell you how, I'll tell you the name, but I'll also tell you how it works. The app is called Sports Recovery Tracker. That's one word, sportsrecoverytracker.com. That's the website. It's a web-based app. It costs $1 a month. Okay. So we made it inexpensive. Yeah. Now, we, we know how to calculate volume. Volume is the number of minutes. Okay. That's how many minutes you train for. Intensity, we calculate that by asking players to say how hard their workout was from zero to 10. So zero is rest. 10 is maximal. Maybe you've heard this term, RPE, rating of perceived exertion. That's what it is. So if you get from, from your player, from every player, you get them to tell you at the end of training how hard the workout was from 0 to 10. Let's just say it was a 7. You take that number. You multiply it by the number of minutes. Let's say it was you know, 60 minutes. There you go. You have a number, and that number is the training load. So the standards, and again, this is the way I teach it, the standards have to be based on the, the weekly training load, not the number of practices. Because you could do three practices a week where the coach is just talking the whole time. Yeah. And there's no load at all. Or you could do three hard, you know, games and, and it's totally different. So the time the, the, the number of practices doesn't tell you anything. So you know what? It's amazing because again, everybody knows and I say it all the time. I, I for me my weekly podcast it's very rare that i prepare but when you know when it's when it's someone with a with a topic as interesting as yours and you know we have to let the cat out of the bag i am yeah. one of your uh, five, one of your speed uh, you know i'm your speed <laughs> disciple uh, i just uh, i've retired now and i'm less fast than i was before but uh, yeah. people know that i'm very fast yeah but one of the main things that you know interests me to you know to meet you and talk to you because we have never met before today. That's right. You know, <laughs> and, and I'm pretty sure we will continue to to be to be friends and to talk. Evaluation time for these clubs, right? Uh, right. You know, they, they, everybody talks about evaluations. The parents want to know where their kids stand. Mm. The coaches want to know what they have. Wouldn't this be like a fantastic foundation to an evaluation for for, for a child? A hundred percent. Again, it was part of the standards that were put in place, but these standards were put in place and then nobody ever checked to see whether or not clubs were doing it. And when the data from the test, which by the way is the data is garbage. Like we just have to say it's, it's completely unreliable hmm. because of the fact that it wasn't standardized. Right. Yeah. 
even though that garbage data was submitted, nobody ever looked at it. So yes, I agree. It would be fantastic to have standardized fitness tests. And it would also be fantastic to have, by the way, if everybody calculated training load in the way that I'm telling you, you could standardize the training load for kids. I, you wouldn't need to ask me what the best training load is. You could have you could have it for the OPDL. You could have it for the Quebec Province, uh, High Performance League. You could have BC. You could have it nationwide. And then after two, three years, once we have enough data, we can say, okay, this is the physical level of the players. This is how much load they get every week. This is what the games look like. And even and to I start. didn't invent this. This is done in other countries. <laughs> I'm just you know, bringing it here. But nobody works with me here. Yeah, the the Canada is very special with that. We like to take only what we what we what we think is important, not what is actually important or what you know seems to be like the sexy important. You know, I, I'll, I'll go I'll go one better, and I'll say that I think that a lot of the people that are in charge of coach development and coach education are okay. They're not competent. They don't have any understanding of sports science at all, and that's because they've only ever been educated here by other people who also had no knowledge. So there's no, there was never any foundation of knowledge and therefore there's never been a transfer of knowledge. And on top of that, the people who are put in charge also don't have experience at the higher levels. So here's what I'll say, okay? If you go anywhere else in the world, and I've been there, okay? You look at the, the FA and the coach licensing that's done through the FA, you will see the instructors are only people who have coached the national team and professional clubs. Wow. I've seen it in Uruguay, I've seen it in Argentina, I've seen it in Europe, and I've seen it even in other CONCACAF countries, including the United States. Wow. Canada, as far as I can see, is the only country where the people who teach coach education have no high-level experience at all. No national team, no professional. So what we have is the blind leading the blind. So yes, it would be nice... But we would need to bring in actual experts that have national, international, and professional experience, and they need to be the teachers. When you go to a coach license here in, 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 you know, in Quebec or in Canada, whatever it is, that, what you're getting is it's like a, a, somebody that wants to go to law school, and you go to a law school where the teachers have never practiced law. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's uh, that's this is uh, really amazing stuff. Again, I, I thank you so much, uh, Richard. Like it's really eye-opening. It's a, it's a topic that we would never have been able to. We have a question there. Uh, this has been a great episode. I unfortunately need to leave early. Yeah, thanks. It's okay. Catch the rest when you're on your treadmill because Richard's that's putting right. everybody back on the treadmill. <laughs> We'll definitely rewatch the episode and check on the website. Uh, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Uh, you know, Richard, uh, when I said that, you know, uh, because we went through evaluations at the local club, I've seen other evaluations, you know, just what you just said about development age, that's that's astonishing. Like that, that should be core information that everybody needs. And this at the club level, this should be, you know, the, the uh, I say TD, it might not be his job, but he has to be able to put some of this information together to see where his players are growing and how to how to how to continue to improve his program right I, uh, yeah I, is it me who's crazy or uh... no 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 man no and and the truth is i don't blame you know the coaches and the technical directors because the truth is that they have not been given the resources or the yeah. knowledge as i said you can't get an a license i mean never mind an a license i mean in uruguay i know that country very well because i yeah. live there you know <laughs> you cannot even get the 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 Entry level coach license that that's the license that you need to coach. They call it settima. So settima means seventh. Yes, that's that's the under 14. That's the youngest age where they have professional academy teams. That license is 1400 hours. It is like a, a college degree and it takes about a year and a half. OK, so and in that license, they have professors from the university that teach exercise physiology, periodization etc. And to get all the way then to the A license, the highest license, okay, you cannot get it in Uruguay or in any other top, you know, football country without having a basic knowledge and understanding of exercise science. You don't need to be, you know, like me and live and breathe and, you know, you don't need to be an expert, but there's a certain level of expertise that you need. Even in the United States, the C, B, and A licenses have mandatory fitness components. Canada has nothing. 
So I don't blame the coaches or the technical directors because yeah. they don't know any mm -hmm. better. Yeah. It has to come from the top. And the truth is the people at the top are not competent. Wow. So in my opinion, we need people, two things we need. We need people uh, who, who are in charge of coach development. We need people that have knowledge and specifically knowledge that they gain somewhere else. Because if you got it here, you got it from other people that don't know. That's one. And two, experience. You should not be teaching in a, in a national license unless you have higher level experience than the people you're teaching. As I said, that's like going to university where you're expecting to get content experts and instead you're getting someone that coaches in the same club that you do. Yeah. Not acceptable. No. Uh, again, uh, great, great stuff. Amazing. I, I would like to just put it into perspective for a, a, or an example. So uh, we'll go with the CDC and how we're doing training now. From what I see, again, this is my local club and others that have friends who share their their their, their training sessions with. Me. How can we fix those training sessions? How, is that something that you know we absolutely need someone like you, or the coaches can they can figure something out to 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 measure load, uh, to 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 increase the intensity? Because I'll be honest with you, I see some of these drills, Richard. Yeah, they're not intense. You know, and people must be thinking, you know, uh, the local soccer show brought on Richard here so that we can bring back people running up mountains and the whole Rocky no. training. No. You know, you can be yeah. like, you, and you said intensity. You can be, you know, very intense and have a ball at your foot. Yeah. If and you could just give us an example of how okay. we would be able to fix that. 100%. So, and, and I want to be clear that like, so the course that I teach called the soccer fitness trainers course. And again, I taught it for many years through Ontario soccer until, you know, we just couldn't, couldn't make it work anymore. But in any case, that course was a hundred percent about teaching coaches, how teaching coaches, not fitness coaches, teaching coaches, how they can do everything they need physically on the field with the ball and not just on the field with the ball, but with their own training, meaning how to use the regular small-sided games, activities, drills, all of it, but how to pay attention to how much running the players are doing, how long they're working for, how intense they're working for, how to measure load, like we talked about, how to measure it, how to test players to determine whether the training is working. All of it can be done. I don't think it's sustainable for amateur clubs to bring in a fitness coach every day. I don't think they're ever, you know, I know we talked about budget, that's part of it, but yeah. it's also just, you know, logistics and you know yes. are there even enough people to do it even you know again I, I know ontario very well the opdl like every single opdl team has their games on the same day and that means they all have to do their fitness training on the same day and you know, like, like it's not possible so yeah. in any case um the only possible person who can administer fitness testing fitness training periodization is the coach so what does that mean that means the coach needs to be trained and you're asking, is it possible? A hundred percent it is. That's what, I mean, I do it. And again, this is knowledge that needs to be taught. And coaches need to be more professional about it. Because as I said, everywhere else in the world, the coaches, especially those who are working with the high performance players, they are, it is demanded of them that they know this stuff. They don't need to be an expert, but they need to know enough that they can do a test, that they can plan training, that they can deliver training and monitor the results and they can track the data. You cannot get an A license anywhere else in the world unless you know that. Canada is the only place. So. You know, and, and I think because I've done a lot of research myself, president in the background, you know, with the CDC and how mm. they prepare for it and, you know, what they need to submit to the province, that, at least for Quebec, yeah. that's the way right. it works. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm saying TD because that's the person who has right. the, the mission statement and what he has to do. Yeah. Like this is something that you know uh, a club can work with uh, with its municipality or its problem. We have an expert now. Uh, I'm gonna say Richard because Richard's on the show, but you know, again, logistically, mm. like you said, I'm pretty sure you're not the only one in the world that does this. Nope, <laughs> so, not at all. You know, <laughs> there's not an excuse. Now, what's frustrating is you know why it's not implemented. Obviously, you know. Uh, I'm on your side with this because I think it's 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 really important information that can grow with the player. And right. we keep we keep stats about stupidity all the time. We might as well keep good stats about someone's health. Right. 
Yeah, you know, and yeah. as they grow as a player, because the clubs now, you know, we're seeing with you know, like a player uh, example, Kone, who, who is with the national team. You understand? This is a player that's developed through you know multiple clubs. Uh, long story short, uh, 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 CF Montreal, and then he's in the national team, and now he's at Qatar. You understand? Like that's how maybe how many times could that possibly happen? <laughs> yeah. And you're you're telling me now that no one had that data on this guy, so we just can we just it just it, it just worked. This is um, so the the uh, the kind of colloquial expression of saying we infer causation from correlation, meaning when a player comes from a club here and gets to the highest level, and I got you know I, I don't know what happened with this club specifically but you know there's others that came from ontario that i know very well so the player comes from the club or whatever and we assume now that the club must have done everything right because there he is right and you know i get it like of course th th i'm sure there's things that were done very well in his coaching and development for sure but the only way to really know whether the club environment gave the optimal development to that player is you know then we gotta you know step back a bit and say okay well you know Canada has I don't know like a million players registered right and you know we've got uh, we've got three professional clubs in the MLS we have the CPL we have all these universities are we actually developing the right number of top level players how many players are actually going to professional clubs and signing contracts what's the value of those contracts how many players are performing well at the 1720 uh, World Cups and Pan Am Games. You know, um, what's the number of, uh, of players that are uh, getting starting uh, uh, spots on top uh, leagues in Europe? Like, you know, these are the kind of things. And, you know, I'm not an expert in all this stuff, but believe it or not, I'll tell you what, uh, just this year is an example. I, you know, I presented at, at, the, at the Congress on Science and Football in Portugal. By the way, I'm the only Canadian that's been to every single one of those since 2007 nobody from the csa has ever gone nobody from any of the provincial associations it's only me and my colleagues we go on our own wow. so so in any case i want to tell you about portugal because yeah. portugal is one of the top soccer nations in the world they punch above their weight okay they just won a futsal world cup they won a euro you know uh, they're consistently Couple getting years. to the world cup they're doing an excellent job developing players they're also doing an excellent job with their coaches they export their, coaches their, all over the world. Their academies, like you know, uh, Benfica, Porto, produce a lot of even talent. even even the smaller clubs even like Braga smaller. and whatever. A lot of them. So Portugal, okay, as good as they are, they are so critical of themselves because they think they can be doing more. They started a partnership between the Portuguese FA and ten different universities across the country, where the universities are now funded by the government to conduct research on the national team players. And teams. Wow. So they are they are trying to optimize player development. And the research is not just in physical training. They're doing psychology. They're doing performance analysis. They're doing uh, nutrition. Okay. Uh, uh, they have a team of experts working together to optimize development. And we have what amounts to coincidences. Yeah. That's what happens. Correlation doesn't equal causation. Just because a player came from a club doesn't mean that the club did everything to optimize the development yeah. of that player. We have no idea what we've done well and what we haven't because nobody, as I said, at the top, we don't even have anybody competent to measure things. Yeah. So. Uh, another another question. I know we're, we're, this is uh, 50 minutes has flown by and no I, know I don't want to take here. too no. much of your time. I know you're very I'm busy. You're at the gym. You're going to probably run on the treadmill for about four hours just to get your load up. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, we're talking about soccer. Yeah. Richard, does this exist in other sports? Like, I would be very surprised that this doesn't exist in hockey. You know, especially how Canada is so hockey-centric. Uh, yeah. So, that's interesting. So, so um, this, is, this is, again, be careful that you don't infer, uh, you know, causation from correlation. So, we have the best hockey teams in the world, right? Okay. But, you know. How much of that is due to the fact that we have a hockey culture here? How much of that is due to the fact that we have this history around the game um, with these very, very old NHL clubs? I mean, I don't know how old they are, but they're, you know, I think they're probably been coming up on almost 100 years old yeah, by now. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so, you know, 
obviously it's Canada is a winter country and you know we have ice we have these you know the, the, we still have pickup hockey we have all this stuff right so so you know the truth is that if we look at like like i'm talking about sports science that's what i know right okay i know sports science and i know coaching okay um canada is not conducting or publishing any really noteworthy research in sports science in hockey either wow so we're not like leaders on the science and technology front in that sport either is I there don't, is there any sport that we actually measure not really like we, we you know lacrosse we, no like the Bowling? thing is, is <laughs> honestly listen one day maybe if you travel you know uh, go to you know go to the united states go to australia you know maybe not now but at some point go to china you know what you see in countries like that is that you know they, those countries want to be the best at everything And if they don't produce good athletes in, I mean, Australia is a good example to me. You know, they, I mean, they have, I, I talked about Portugal, you know, and, you know, places like that. Like, like, you know, it's not acceptable to these countries that they don't, you know, develop top athletes. And, and they've recognized that part of the way that they develop top athletes is by connecting to, you know, universities and, and, yeah. and op optimizing the sports science part of it. Canada is not doing it. Okay. In any if sport, we go, if we go to our it. neighbor to the south, the states, <laughs> yeah, are they better? Yes. Okay. Yes, and and uh, obviously it's a much bigger country. Yes. There's much more money. I mean, it, it's different, right? Like yeah. you know, we we can't be unrealistic about things, but but you know, are they better? Yes. You know, they. I mean, they they, they have uh, they have a much different uh, you know infrastructure around you know uh, coaching, coach education sports science research that is done with you know the top level uh, you know national uh, team programs and, and even individual sport programs you know part of it is money but you know it's not just money and canada canada has money yeah. <laughs> we're not a we're not a you know they a do, country that's and, not wealthy yeah. you know and when so. we saw it with, with the olympics and it's a couple of times i bring it and it's very frustrating to me you know like a, mm. i see a lot of You know, increased price in the, in uh, in uh, you know in signups for kids for soccer, especially yeah. at the competitive level. Yeah. You know, we're now Team Canada uh, has made the Qatar. When we had the Olympics, they went you know they went crazy with the podium program, right? They did everything and anything possible because we were hosting the the, the Olympics in our backyard to yeah. make sure that we end yeah. up on the podium. Why do they put so much emphasis? Only when it's like really, really needed instead of looking and reaching out to people like you yeah. and having a sustained, a sustained program where, you know, they can do it for a longer period of time. And not yeah. only for, I'm not only talking about soccer, yeah, I'm right. shocked yeah. that we don't, we don't produce any reports on how to build a player. Because if, if I think about it as a caveman, if I would really want to invent a hockey player, yeah. like I'm coming to Canada. I'm, you got I the raw materials here. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I want to. I want him to yeah. come out of Regina. Yeah. I want him to play in the Western Hockey League. I want him to his name to be Kyle, and I want him to destroy <laughs> people. You know, like yeah. if I'm, yeah. a, and I'm shocked that we don't even produce these metrics that you're talking about with the with the sport that we love. So let alone soccer, which is a secondary or third third choice sport. Yeah, um, it shocks me, right? So. I, I got, you know, honestly, I don't have all the answers. Like the, the one thing I would say is I, I know there's, there's definitely been a big shift here in Canada um, with, you know, I, I go back to coach education because to me, this is like the, you know, the, the, the real missing piece, you know, is there's been a shift. Like, I think we all could probably have agreed, you know, I, I think you and I are close in age and, you know, the coaching that we would have got in the 1980s and 90s, you know, It was somebody's father. Yes. You know, there was probably a lot of yelling and screaming. There was probably a lot of inappropriate things being said. And, and Or just all of it, out right? of so, experience. Right. So, so, you know, anyway, we can agree that, that that wasn't ideal. But instead of sort of finding a happy medium where the training can still be demanding, where there's still, you know, discipline and players are pushed and all of that, we, we've gone way too far to the other side where, like, like all I'm seeing when I see – a good example okay there's a soccer summit coming up in ontario next year and I, i don't know i see a lot of topics around 
safe sport and you know kind of the 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 compliance and the administrative and so it's all about you know making players feel comfortable and included and like i get it you know i I don't like as i said there's an extreme and there's things that you know are, are not optimal but there's a happy medium and instead of finding that happy medium we seem to focus so much on Again, like there's no standards. I mean, why are we not keeping scores in these young age groups? Why are why are there no standings? Why have we gone away from, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, tournaments that give, uh, you Medals. know, why? Like it's like it, you don't need like you can have competition if you have coaches that know what they're doing. You can have very very competitive youth leagues and tournaments, and nobody you know nobody gets discouraged, nobody drops out. It doesn't happen, and you know how I know that. Is because it happens in many other countries. Exactly. We lie. We lie to coaches here when we tell them that everywhere else in the world they don't care about winning. That's not true. I've been there. I can tell you right now. Okay, the top clubs in Uruguay, if the youth teams are not winning, the coaches are not going to stay there. They want to develop and they want to win at the same time. I talked just recently to somebody from Benfica. As I said, I was there, you know, in, in Portugal in, in, in the summer. Okay, he said flat out. He said you cannot develop without winning, because if if you have talented young players that come up in a youth system where they are told it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, when they get to the highest level, they don't compete. But somehow we've got this thing in our heads. As I said, I think we need a happy medium. We need to be more demanding. Yeah, look, I. I go to bat for you on this because I talk to everybody that comes on the show. I'm not a seventh place father uh, or a participation father. You're seventh place. I'm going to let you know that you're a seventh place. And you know what? We'll try to take some positives. I'm not a, I'm not a caveman. I'm not an animal. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take some positives at it. But I, I need to show my son or my daughter that, you know, the world works like this. You win and you lose. And I'm a big believer You know, when I talk to my friends about soccer and, you know, I'm a very proud Milan fan and, you know, mm. they talk to me about Roma, they talk to me about Naples, teams that are, you know, they have won but very little. I teach, I, 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 my response to them is that these teams need to know how to lose sometimes to learn how to win because it's really hard to lose. But in life, you don't get a medal for seventh place. You get fired. You get fired. Right. Right, and and, and, and and again, that's my argument to exactly those same people who yeah. say, you know, we don't need standings, we don't need the, and, we don't want to keep statistics. I said, but guys, the world keeps statistics. And, people and, know how many projects I deliver. Right, and 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 it's a misconception that that we, like we, we make this assumption that it's automatic if a kid is on a team that's losing all the time that that kid is going to hate soccer and drop out. No, if that's the case, that's because th there's no leadership in place that is coaching this kid properly and putting this into perspective and yeah. saying, Hey, look, yeah, you know, okay, you lost. And we can look at some of the things, you know, maybe you made some mistakes. Maybe, maybe the developmental age of the team you played against is a year ahead of you and there's nothing you can do. Maybe, you know what, you did your best. And these are the things that, you know, you really did well. And let's focus on those fine, you know, but, but we cannot just eliminate standards and expect, uh, you know, to develop talent. And that's why I'm saying, I, you know, I, I question, you know, when we start saying this player was developed here, and eh, you know, I don't, I don't infer, I don't infer causation from correlation. No, I, I don't, no. you know, I don't, I don't. I'm going to remember that. That's a, that's a, that's a good saying <laughs> yeah. that I never heard before. Yeah. Uh, you know, Richard, we're an hour in. It flew by. Uh, I, I will have you on again. We're going to pick other Great. topics yeah, that we're going to yeah. pick your brain about. <laughs> sure. I, I have your email now, so you know you're going to get some questions from me. Yeah. Uh, I like to do this with all my guests. Uh, you know, I wanna, I wanna, uh, I wanna make sure that we we end off on, on a happy note. That we're, right. This is great information. This quick fire questions before I let you tell people where they can find you, where they can find your business, if they're in the Toronto region, uh, when you're gonna open up your Mon Montreal oh. chapter, <laughs> yeah. and so on and right. so forth. Right. But quick fire questions that you know, just to pick your brain and get uh, and get some uh, get some laughs out of it. Sure. So yeah. for me. I top. It's not the top, the top question comes at the end, but you know, I think you answered it. But you, you're you're a soccer guy. You watch Serie. A. Who's your favorite team? I'd say C Milan. Always has been, and and, and I'm very optimistic about this year. So nice. 
No, I and your favorite good. player? No, present time? and in the past. Present and oh, in the past. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, in, in the past, it was, it was, I have Paolo Maldini and, and, and Gennaro Gattuso. And, and, and Maldini was, I wanted to be like him, but I wasn't like him. I was probably a little more like Gattuso, so, yeah. even though I wasn't, you know, but I, he, he was my guy. Right now, who do I like the best right now? I mean, I like Sadio Mane. Yeah, Sadio Mane from Liverpool. Right yeah, now, now he's yeah. at Bayern Munich. Yeah, yeah, not because I, you know, I, as I said, I was more of a defensive midfielder type and whatever, but just I, I, I just I like everything about him. I mean, he's, he's, he's athletic, he's skilled, he's he's a hard worker. Yeah, yeah, I really like him. You yeah. have any other team other than Milan that you follow? <laughs> In England, I've always liked Liverpool. And part is part of that is because I, I I presented at at one of those science and football conferences there, and you know we got to tour the the city and and the stadium, which is like any any football fan should should go there because Anfield is really like a really impressive place, and and they have that kind of like that from the city, like that 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 really humble kind of, you know, it's like a it was an industrial town, you know, yeah. and 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 so they they're not as flashy like like Anfield is beautiful, but it doesn't look like uh, Old Trafford or. Yeah. And, and, and they try to instill that into the players. And I saw that and I liked it. So I, I, I like Liverpool. Nice. And, you know, for people to get to know you, did you have a mentor that pushed you in this direction or, uh, you know, someone who influenced you to go into the sports science? Yeah. So th there's a couple that I'll name. Um, so one of them is, uh, is my coach at university who I also coached with at York University. His name is Paul James. Um, and I know he's had a you know a bit of a rough uh, time lately and, and and all that, but but you know he 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 was a huge influence on me. He coached me in my last year at York. I was a captain under him, and, and really you know he influenced me a lot. Um, uh, Paolo Pacione, I don't know if you know that name, but no, no. So he was he was the fitness coach at Montreal with the Impact. Oh, okay. He's one of my best friends. Um, uh, and he he actually was working as a fitness coach even before me. I mean, I started kind of young, but you know, he was he was doing it at the highest level before me, my age. So he started when he was like 20 years old, and he worked with the Toronto. Oh, we got to get Paulo on. I you had absolutely the Toronto should. guy before pa the Montreal guy. Paulo now, okay, is actually the director of performance with Club America in Mexico. So this Ooh. is the biggest club in North yeah. America. And, uh, you know, he's had a fantastic career. He still is a mentor to me. I mean, we talked just last month and, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he's, he's, a, he's a big one. And then, um, you know, I, I'd have to just say as well, um, uh, and, and unfortunately he's uh, no longer with us now, but, but Gary Miller, I don't know if you know that name. Or, so Gary, Gary was, the, was the technical director at Ontario Soccer. And okay. way back when, Gary was a coach of mine in the Ontario Provincial Program and He had an academy called Bryce, uh, okay. which I, you know, he helped me try to get, you know, he, he connected me with some universities. I, I ended up going to York, but he was, he was kind of like the first um, real good, knowledgeable coach that I had, Gary Miller. Unfortunately, as I said, he, you know, he passed away in, in 2020 and, wow. you know, rest in peace to him. But, but yeah, th th those are the three. So Amazing. Amazing. Richard, now you're all about fitness <laughs> and health, but I'm pretty sure you eat. So, uh, oh yeah. If I tell I you pizza or pasta, what do you pick? I love pizza, but honestly, a good pasta with a pesto sauce to me, a homemade pesto. Okay, uh, okay. So this is perfect. Yeah, so, this yeah, is perfect so. <laughs> because it leads me to my most important question for my guests. Yeah. This pesto, you know, get, you know, Richard, you get home, you 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 run 700 miles on your on your treadmill, super fast treadmill. You you know someone someone punches you in the stomach and they get hurt, but you need to eat. You're yeah. eating this plate of pasta. Right. We're selecting penne. Are they penne lisce or penne rigate? I like rigate. Rigate. I do. Nice. I do. Yeah. I mean, yes. uh, yeah. That's it. But 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 it's all about the sauce. And yeah. and, and I, I got to be honest, I'm not a good cook. But my wife, I married an Italian. My oh, yeah. wife is an excellent cook, and she makes, to me, restaurant quality pesto. And that's shout uh, out. It's shout fantastic. out to Richard's yeah. wife, Christina. 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 Yeah. Christina. <laughs> Christina, get ready because if I'm coming to Toronto and this guy's gonna make me run on the treadmill, I'm 100%, coming. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, I want to thank you so much, Presidente and the Master Control. I want to thank you so much. I'm going to thank uh, also, again, Evangelist Sports guys. The World Cup is here. 
Go get your stuff. You want something? Go buy it. The guys at Evangel, guys and girls at Evangelist Sports are gonna hook you up online at their store in beautiful Montreal. Richard, if you're ever in Montreal, you know, you contact me and Presidente, and we will we will surely meet up and have a nice little bite to eat. I would say we would train, but you know, by my oh, size. Nice. I'm not in the training. Uh, I'm not in the training game yet. <laughs> Maybe you can convince me otherwise. But <laughs> Richard, thank you very much. Before we go, please let people know how they can, you know, either reach you or inquire about your stuff. If we, you know, if we're sharing this, other clubs, guys, you know, I will try to bring this mm -hmm. up at my club. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure Marcello will do the same at his. But if you're sharing this, Richard is the guy that you need for the sports fitness stuff. Pick his brain and, you know, tell us how they can reach you, Richard. Sure. Great. So, I mean, I, as I said, you know, Soccer Fitness was my first company. We rebranded to Speed Training, but there's there's two websites. One of them, they're easy to remember. One of them is soccerfitness.ca, all one word, so soccerfitness.ca. The other is speedtraining.ca. Okay. And both of those, there are emails, which would be richard at soccerfitness.ca and richard at speedtraining.ca. So, The websites will have all the information, including, you know, the coach education stuff that I'm doing, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the training, the research, it's all there. All the articles I've published, they're all there. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy, honestly, anyone who emails me about anything, I always respond if it's advice, if it's, you know, I know somebody asked about the app and I saw you guys put the URL up there. Like, yeah. like um, if, you know, if there's a way that I can direct you, I mean, I've got a YouTube channel. I've got a lot of free stuff, right? So if somebody wants information and I can direct you to the free content, I'll do it. If you yes. want to set up a, you know, a coaching course out there or, or online, you know, I'm happy to do, you know, it's my business, right? So, yeah. so I, I'll, 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 anyone who messages me, I, I will reply. So fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Richard, once again, thank you very much. Again, stay on because we're going to pick your brain after we get the camera goes off. And guys, please share this with your club. Share this with your association, your region. Guys, if you're from Canada Soccer, get this, get this material up to Canada Soccer because Richard knows what he's talking about. And let's get some stats on these kids so that we can produce more, uh, you know, and we can develop properly. Guys, I want to thank you. I'm Stevie P. Marcello's in Master Control. Richard's in Toronto. Buonasera. And Forza Milan and the local soccer show.